welcome everybody to another Vita Learning Webinar. Today we've got Mr. Felix Pages. Hi Felix, how are you doing? Fine, thank you. Good, excellent. So Thursday uh, afternoon for those of you on the East Coast, Felix resides there in uh, Florida, so uh, he's, his day is halfway over. Mine's just beginning, which is good. Uh, but today, Felix is going to go over uh, the topic, the identifying the incisal area for creating a lifelike smile. So this will be a, a nice presentation for those of you looking on um, tips and tricks on how to, um, you know, elevate your, your enamel looks. Before we get into the presentation today, just a, a, a couple of uh, uh, house cleaning items. Everyone that join, uh, joined us is, your phone is on mute. So on the right-hand side of your display, you should see a panel. There's a question box. So if you do have any questions, go ahead and type it out, send it in. And then at the end of the program, we will have a uh, Q&A. Uh, this workshop, the webinar, is going to be recorded. You can give us a couple of days, but you can go visit, revisit that. Um, and say, hey, what did, what did Felix say about this or is that? You can go revisit it on our Vita Learning website, the Vita North America YouTube channel, where we post all of these plus our links from our social media sites as well. So before we get going, identifying the incisal area for creating a lifelike smile, Felix Pages is a, a CDT. I, in 1976, he had an honors graduate. He's an honors graduate from the University of Kentucky Lexington uh, Technical Institute. After graduating, he worked for the for a prosthodontist facility at the University of Florida College of Dentistry, and collaborated with a Dr. Harry Lundeen and other members of the faculty. In 1978, Felix relocated to California with the company. Preset, uh, precursor to Vita, uh, Vita uh, Unitech Corporation as a course instructor for Vita Porcelains. The next year, Felix was promoted to laboratory project manager for all new products. During that time, Felix traveled and taught courses in many parts of the world and has presented in many domestic and international meetings. Felix is a founding member of the ISDC and was the first keynote speaker for the group in 1983. He was invited to speak at the first Quintessence Ceramic Symposium in 1984. He's also a founding member of the Quad Seaver Art and Experience Group. Among other recognitions, he's received uh, the FDLA Crowning Achievement Award in 2011 for his contributions to the dental laboratory industry. Felix is currently a key opinion leader for Vita North America and America Dental Group. So Felix, we will yes. be turning this over to you and I am going to make you the presenter. And now you are the presenter. And now let's see if we can see your screen here. I see your screen, and now if you just go into, yep, there you are. You're off and running. So I will uh, get out of my camera, my webcam, and if you need anything, just uh, shout, and I'll be back, and I'll see you at the end of the uh, your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's past noon here in Miami. Beautiful day today. It's been really hot, but that's kind of normal for here. So <clears throat> today the lecture is identifying the incisal area for creating a lifelike smile. And before we can do that, we have to know what enamel is, what it's made out of, and why it looks the way it does. And I've always been that way. If I'm supposed to be doing something, I gotta figure out why I'm supposed to be doing it instead of just doing it. So I've done a lot of work here the last, uh, couple of weeks on uh, getting some articles that are from 2019 forward on any new research on enamel. And I found some very, very good things. Even as uh, in 2020, there's a breakthrough 
discovery that I'll share with you first, and then we'll go on to uh, explain how enamel manipulates light, et cetera, et cetera. So let's get started. So if you want a good reference for anatomy, which explains what each piece of the tooth has in it, enamel, dentine, cementum, et cetera, et cetera, this is a very good book, Robert P. Renner, An Introduction to Dental Anatomy and Aesthetics. The book was published in 1985, so uh, things have been around. I also have one that was published in 1937 in England called Dental Anatomy. And it's, they're both very good books, and it's amazing how much they could see way back then. So let's look at the composition of enamel. Enamel is basically uh, calcium and phosphorus. It's called calcium hydroxyapatite, and they create uh, elongated hexagonal crystals. It's got a little bit of water in it, and 1% enamel matrix, which is composed of proteins, and it's sort of like a binder of everything. Enamel has a high modulus elasticity, but it has a low stents uh, tensile strength, especially when it's not backed by dentine. So you can have a lot of chipping when you have uh, occlusal problems, or a lot of protrusive wear, which is caused by occlusal problems, and that you can get a lot of chipping, et cetera. The enamel is very, very light refractive, and it's also biofringent, uh, which means double refractive, and it causes this beautiful uh, a re, a refraction and scatter of light. The refractive index of human enamel is 1.62, air is one, that's your standard. And if you can get a material, a ceramic, that gets very close to this 1.62, you have a very, very good chance of being able to match uh, the scatter of tooth enamel. And normal glass is 1.5, and then you can seed it and put, uh, make it nucleate some crystals so that you can have a very nice uh, scatter from normal enamel. The, no, the, the color of real human enamel could be grayish or bluish in color, and it is absolutely influenced by the underlying dentine. So you could have a very translucent enamel, um, the same on an A1 as you do an A4. And so it's just going to look different because the enamel is translucent. So the hydroxyapatite crystals in the tooth enamel are really tiny. So HA stands for hydroxyapatite. And so these little baby crystals are 0.2 to 0.4 micron. And what that does is it modifies the incoming light so that the color that is reflected is like a bluish hue and the red yellowish uh, longer waves are transmitted. If anybody's ever been next to a dental chair <laughs> and you can see the doctor putting a light on there and looking at the lingual of the teeth, all the linguals of the teeth look orange. If the light source comes from inside the mouth, the lingual looks normal like the facial used to look when the light was hitting it. And now what looks yellow orange is the facial of the teeth or the, the, all the teeth. So basically, the enamel acts as a filter and it modifies the wavelengths of light. So whenever you have a, a wavelength of light, and I'll explain this more in the next couple of slides, if it hits a particle smaller than 0.5 microns, it's forced to re reflect bluish light. That's why the sky is blue. The other problem is, is that enamel always does this light play and it always changes color depending on the incoming light. So that if you do not have, let's just say an opal effect powder and also fluorescence, which I'll get into a little bit later, in the ceramic itself that can mimic what the enamel does, you don't have a good chance of really hitting a home run. The, the blue hue that you see sometimes in the proximal areas, which is enamel that's not backed by dentine, therefore it's has a lot of space to scatter and it looks as beautiful bluish like the sky blue. And you have to paint it on, like in the case of some full contours or cunny crowns, you have to stain that and it just doesn't look as real. You can get close, but 
but it's not as uh, perfect as, as the other ones. So the phenomena where you see this uh, yellow, uh, bluish or orange bluish reaction is known as Rayleigh scattering. And that was uh, a guy by the name of Lord Rayleigh. I can't remember his real name, but he basically, he and his uh, assistant, a uh, gentleman by the name of Tyndall, are the ones that separated atmospheric gases from air by compressing these gigantic uh, reinforced glass spheres. And they would pump so much pressure in there. And when the light shone through, Tyndall said, look, at the, the, this is changing colors. It's turning blue like the sky. And then they determined that the silica content in the air that we breathe, uh, that's pumped in there by desert sands, the uh, volcanic activity. I mean, the atmosphere is always full of uh, sand particles. Some are baby, some are not so baby. So that if they hit a particle less than 0.4 microns, you get the blue scatter. In the air, the heavier silica particles drift down to the Earth's surface. And when the sun comes up, it goes through a very, very dense layer, and they're much larger particles, up to 0.7 microns. Then this means that uh, the light can bounce off of that particle which is full of uh, iron oxide and other minerals, and it imparts that yellow-orange color to your sunrises and sunsets. You can find this in Yamamoto's book, 1984, published. It's called Metal Ceramic. Uh, and I can't remember. I can't see the page number because of this little panel, but it doesn't matter. It's like 286, I think. So this is the uh, a schematic of what happens when you get up in the morning and you see this beautiful yellow orange sunrises and sunsets and then as the sun comes up in the morning sky it's forced to go through a really really thin layer of super tiny particles and that's where you get this short wave scatter it looks exactly like the neck of a tooth where the dentine is much more closer to the surface and the enamel is thinning out to nothing so that that's why you see this color of dentine on all of a sudden you get this beautiful bluish enamel uh, especially when it's unbacked by dentine so it's the same reason the enamel looks bluish and manipulates the light like that it's exactly the same as the guy sunrises and sunsets there's absolutely no difference so he also compared in fact i was there when in Japan, Unitech sent me to study with Yamamoto while he was publishing this book and the Shofu company uh, was very gracious. And I got to spend quite a bit of time with Yamamoto and, uh, you know, they were comparing resin shade guides, which are glass filled and they match the teeth a lot better than the porcelain ones because the porcelain shade guides do not have an opal effect. So from the beginning, we're starting out with a challenge because the shade guides that we're trying to reproduce the two shades with uh, don't, don't do the same thing to the light that the human tooth does. So you have to have a porcelain that can sort of mimic some of this activity of the enamel so that it looks the same under different lighting conditions. Uh, the same thing with the opal stones, a uh, white opal reflecting shortwave light. And if you put the light behind it, it looks orange, just like the teeth do. So it's, this is an opal stone is formed when you have molten silica, like an, a volcanic uh, like glass, and then it hits the water and you have molecular water in between these little spheres, and it produces this beautiful effect. The same as the teeth, the same as the sky. It's all particles um, manipulating the light coming in. So little tiny particles push out the blue and let the red go by. And that's why the teeth look the way they do. And if, if you think you can go outside and let the patient look and say, oh, look how much better it looks, that's the worst light because it changes temperature constantly. You need a good artificial light source. That's about anywhere from 5,500 Kelvin temperature, which is the same as flash in your in your camera, 
to be able to interpret better color, not not outside, because at noontime in Miami, right now, if you go outside, you're going to blind yourself. It's too bright, and you can't see anything. And so <clears throat> you look at the GPS position of where the most favorable light is here in Miami, as far as being able to have a mo most neutral 65 uh, 100 degrees Kelvin, it's around four to five in the afternoon. And that's where it's best to take the shades. If you really insist on having to go outside to look at a shade. Now, the other problem is when you have these human enamel rods, they look like little hexagons. And we were always taught that they are perpendicular to the dentine. And, and when it gets to a cusp tip, they kind of twist. And it's known as gnarled enamel, G-N-A-R-L-E-D. And what that does is it gives sort of like a cushion to the centric cusp especially. And this latest research, which was published in 2020, it says here, crystal misorientation uh, toughens human tooth enamel. And this was, uh, I believe it was partially funded by the NIH. and Another one was called Complexity of Human Tooth Enamel Revealed at the Atomic Level. This is the one that got me. So what they did is they have a special lighting machine uh, that uses polarized light uh, by a place called Advanced Light Source, ALS. And it shows that these enamel rods are actually arranged with certain angles right next to each other. They're not like perfectly uh, bunched up together parallel. And what that does is it toughens the enamel dramatically. You know, and of all the species on the planet, we're the only ones that keep enamel through our entire lifetime. They compared a mouse, which the enamel is changing continuously uh, through its life. Sharks replace the teeth. We know about sharks here in Florida. <laughs> And so the most important thing is, is that it allows for tremendous masticatory forces to be put on this enamel. And, it, and yet, because of the underlying dentine that's soft with a, a 37 gigapaxels of strength, it actually flexes a little bit and it keeps the enamel from breaking off. If you lose dentine behind the enamel, as in the case of incisal wear, and that facial enamel is much more prone to cracking and chipping. So human enamel rods viewed as light. If you see the bottom left of this uh, beautiful picture here, you can see that there's certain orientations of these crystals and they're, they're basically in, in a special order. And what that does is it strengthens the enamel Dramatically, they never knew uh, this uh, before 2019, 2020, when it was published. So what they're doing is they're, the research is in order to identify new materials that can replace human enamel in restorations or even fillings. And so the research continues, but this is a big step forward with using this new uh, ALS. So you can read this on the bottom. In this map, color is used to distinguish between crystal orientation within the rod-shaped structure that constitute the building blocks of human enamel. And so these three groups of rods are visible, longitudinal, transverse, and oblique. Color shifts within shows that con constituent nanocrystals are slightly misaligned, which makes them tougher. So, they did some testing to see how you could stop a crack. So you know how we're always talking about stopping cracks in their tracks in zirconia. They're also trying to do this with other materials. So they did some, and you can see the dynamics of this uh, grain boundaries. And on the left, 47 degree angle, four, 0, 14, and 47. A crack starting from the bottom propagates all the way through 0 and 47, but it's deflected at the 14 degree interface. So some of these new materials are taking this into account to try to keep things from cracking or stressing. So 
it's a really tough article to read. Somebody in my brain, it is, it's tough. Basically, in a nutshell, by if you see the blue picture, if they're all arranged perfect, like we used to think, that would drop right down. Like you karate chop some blocks and you're done. But this one, you have different orientations. You can see that the crystals are arranged differently with the different colors, with a slight twist, and that stops the that stops the stresses quite effectively in the human tooth. So if you go back to 1974 when McLean went to LSU and wrote the, wrote a book, uh, he came in. That was like the second British invasion after the the Beatles. They had the Science and Art of Dental Ceramics, Volume One and Volume Two in 1980. And he basically was trying to describe what a tooth does. Uh, you have a light coming in and certain areas of the tooth, you have diffused reflection, which is the light coming through from the dentine. You have the pink hue from the gum affecting the cervical color. That's why it's difficult to use some of these shade taking devices that if you get too close, you can influence the neck color because the tissue is, is affecting it. And so you have diffuse transmission, which is the most translucent area where you don't have any dentine backing the enamel. And you have reduced diffusion through the whole middle of the tooth. So if, if we take a clue and build a crown up like this, it helps, but you have to have the right preparation. If you have a lot going on in the incisal edge of the teeth from, let's say the edge two to three millimeters up, it doesn't help anybody if the dentist leaves the prep really, really long because they want retention or, or whatever the case might be. And what happens is, is that you're blocking the light where the natural tooth has all the goodies in it that makes it look uh, like a tooth. So if you look at this bluish translucency, in the laterals and in the proximals of the of the central incisors that's a fairly heavy uh, amount of enamel in those areas and it's unbacked by dentine very little and that's why you see this beautiful bluish bluish color and then of course all, uh, in, in a lot of teeth you always see like a little creamy yellow opacity where the lobes are and i'll explain that that in a second because there are a lot of i mean i don't understand how somebody can mistake a developmental lobe for a mammal on i just uh i don't get it but it's done every day even the manufacturers uh put mammal on effect on the bottles it has nothing to do with that so age changes obviously that's my grandson in the upper left when he was a little guy he's 13 now and you can see uh, the lower teeth, just below Peter here, that's the that's a fairly worn uh, central incisors, which they start to look the same from gingiva to incisal edge when you wipe everything out. The only thing that shows it's still soft and bluish are the proximals, because there's no wear there. But the effects, lobe effects, etc., are diminished dramatically. And of course, this replacement crown on, on tooth number eight to nine, it's very hard to get that little blue. You have to mix uh, effect enamel, let's say uh, nine and 10 and VM9. And I can't remember the numbers. I still have to look at the Lumex bottles because I don't have it in my brain yet. So when you're talking about aesthetics, people forget the angle of eminencia. So when you have an opening, like a real steep opening, you have people that have really long teeth with no wear on it. My, our good friend, Perry, who helped design the first computerized furnace from Unitech, the Ultramat, he had absolutely no wear whatsoever on his anterior teeth. I mean, there was nothing you could see. And this was like a 60, something year old individual and he had like perfect teeth, even some slight mammalons present because he's never worn them. So his his uh, angle of an inch is quite steep. So he would open up immediately. He doesn't, he's not like me, like more of a bulldog that you'll flatten your teeth out and then your teeth start to look 
the same from top to bottom, except the proximal. So that you can take clues from a cast. You just have to replace that. If someone's going to do extensive rehabilitation, you can do whatever you want later on once you open up the vertical. But otherwise, uh, take a clue from the cast. If you don't take a picture and you have to do very heavily worn crowns, they don't have a lot of translucency close to the incisal edge unless it's really steep and the whole lingual enamel and the dentine is worn, worn off. So incisal effects are almost gone due to wear, see? So now you have a little tiny bit of facial enamel left. And what did I tell you earlier in the slide? All the studies is that if you have enamel that's not backed by dentine, it has a tendency to chip. And that's what's happened here in quite a few patients. So that you have to restore a little bit the vertical and then uh, go ahead and do whatever this patient needs. So dentine developmental lobes are inside the tooth. That's how the tooth forms. You have three bulges which are developmental lobes and two depressions which are developmental grooves. And the cingulum is the fifth lobe. Mammalons are those tiny little bumps on outside the tooth, not inside the tooth. So whenever somebody does a mammal on effect, it's like, what are you talking about? And this, the, those go on the edge and they usually are worn down. This is a, you know, fairly young patient, early twenties would look, they've already wiped out the mammalons, but he has no occlusion anywhere else. That's why those teeth are shaped like that. And look at the beautiful bluish, translucency by unbacked enamel because those peaks that stick out there and also you see a halo. So it's basically, you have to contrast. Uh, when you build these crowns up, you do a little cut back, you put your blue in there, and then you just follow it up with a little line of the same dentine. That's a real easy way to do it. The same dentine that you used on your, on your crown Put it right up on top of the incisal edge and that contrast of the soft blue translucency and opacity looks exactly like like the tooth does so it's basically the light entering the tooth and it's getting transmitted through the tooth and it exits in the incisal edge and that's why you see that whitish creamy look if you put your finger behind those teeth the that that edge will go away that creamy look will disappear because you're stopping the light so that's how you create that effect. Now, when you look at these beautiful teeth, this is my friend, Angel, he's got gorgeous teeth and you can see the lobes inside, distinct lobes. And then you see this soft bluish, it could be a sky opal, opal sky, whatever, and Lumax or a T9, depending on what you're using or effect enamel nine and 10 mixed together. You put that on top of the dentine lobes, and I prefer to fire that, and then I come back and uh, finish off the crown. And that how you, that's how you reproduce these beautiful effects here. But you see, if you have everything monolithic, it's very hard to, to make it look like that. You're never gonna get full contour zirconia to look like this. You can talk about, uh, uh, 3D printing zirconia and everything else. And uh, obviously nobody's really, they, they're doing it a little bit, but uh, if you mess up, you gotta grind all that out of there. It's so much easier just to do a little thin layer and build it up. Another thing to remember, which is really interesting is you have to think about something. If you have teeth that fluoresce, uh, strongly for us, remember that dentinal lobes are dentine. And so you have to use a really reduced uh, fluorescing material if you want to do these lobes, because if not, they'll appear way too bright under, under light. Conversely, if you're done to paint those lobes in on a full contour crown and you use a stain, that doesn't fluoresce, your whole crown may fluoresce beautifully, but you'll see dark spots wherever you, you go with excessive stain. I, I haven't checked all the stains with uh, fluorescent light to make sure if there's even a stain that fluoresces. But that's a really critical point that uh, 
you know, it's another little piece of the puzzle that the manufacturers have to address if they really want to knock a home run because it's difficult to uh, recreate what these beautiful teeth are doing. And we're getting so close for so many years. And we're talking about the same thing since McLean came here in 1973-74. And we're still trying to do nice work. And of course, the patients and the doctors want white. And whenever you go too white and you put anything that looks natural, they're going to say, what's this little dark spot here? I mean, it's insanity to me, but it's, it's, they're the ones that have to look, look that way. So you have to ask yourself, is what materials are available to reproduce all these enamel and incisal effects? And what are the main considerations? So let's go over what you really need to think about if you're trying to knock a home run on some of these teeth. You have to say, does your porcelain system offer specialty powders for reproducing some of these things? In the case of a full contour zirconia crown or a layered crown, what are you going to do? What is it that you're going to do? Make your mind up. Because if you do a full arch with full contour zirconia, uh, you really should use like a fluo glaze to spray the whole thing because there's no really good fluorescing zirconia. They look terrible. So, and it doesn't play with the light. So if the, everything looks the same, that's why they do all these big arches. So everything looks the same. Now, it, how important is fluorescence? And are the lobe effects barely fluoresce because they're mainly denting? And if you use some of these uh, fluorescent powders to try to build up the quote unquote mammalons, which should be lobes, they could come out too strong. So under a black light, you could have a dark crown with three bright spots inside, or you could have a, a nice fluorescing crown with three dark spots on the outside. So you have to really think about all that. And remember that the human enamel does not fluoresce. The fluorescence comes from inside, the dentine and the cementum. And so whenever you use a monolithic material that is too fluorescent, it just doesn't look natural. It'll, it'll glow in the dark, literally. So fluo glazes are available to spray for non-fluorescing materials. And I actually used it a couple of weeks ago for the first time and it looked, uh, it looked pretty decent. I had to do, the one thing that I do is I have a black light, UV light, 365 nanometers. And I, I put the, uh, let's just say the wash or the glaze, uh, excuse me, the power wash on Lumex and the fluo glaze on a full contour zirconia crown and I actually illuminate it before I fire it to make sure it's covered. Now, if I have a dark spot where the glaze didn't go, I'm not gonna go mess with that because you just create a, a nightmare. So go ahead and fire it and then do a second coat on it. It's not gonna hurt the zirconia and it's not gonna hurt the glaze. So that way you can see how well you're covering it before you even bake it, because it'll fluoresce either way. So take your light, put it under your bench, paint the thing on there, hold it down and say, oh look, I missed a spot, I'm gonna have to cover that later. Or wash it off and start over and hope for the best, because none of these materials, the sprays are good, but they're not perfect. So here's some Lumex powders that you could use. There's an array of things like an opal translucent, all your dentines, opacious and, uh, and regular, et cetera, et cetera. And remember, you can mix any of these with uh, translucent materials or clears to create whatever. But again, it becomes a super custom job. So if you're in a commercial setting and the doctor says A3, you got to hit an A3. There's not much work to it. If he starts complaining too much, about the look, you gotta sit him down and say, what is it that you really want? I mean, you wanna pay me nothing to, to get a premium crown? I mean, you know, it's, it'd be nice to be uh, an ideal person that'll do everything for nothing, but you just can't do that. And so they have to realize what a knockout crown is and it, you may not get it the first time. And so some of the doctors uh, that I've, run into over many, many years, uh, they don't have a clue 
of what even their crowns are made out of. And if you go outside the light, they try to take a picture and send it with may not be the right settings on the camera and expect the, the lab to send back this home run and this just doesn't happen that easy it's very difficult so you have to figure out your system and what you have in it vita has always been really good about creating a powder for every little piece of the tooth you know like they'll make a specialty powder like uh, i remember in the early days they in the VMK-68, they actually had a little bottle that had a pink dot effect. It was a little fluorescent orange pink. And in the shave guide, when you would take the courses, you would scoop out this little circle and put just a little tiny thing. It's a pink dot. And I was like, OK. <laughs> but that's how they made their shave guide. And if you wanted to make the shave guide, the doctor said, well, where's that little pink spot? But it's basically a little tiny fluorescent powder. The rest of the material didn't fluoresce, but that sure did. And if you looked at it under a black light, you'd see one little dot that would shine and the rest of the crown wouldn't. And so those are considerations for the manufacturer. And I know that the uh, fluorescing materials are quite expensive, these rare earth elements. And uh, in fact, in, in 1976, the British, uh, whatever their health service is, they uh, measured the radioactivity on the old Vita Deer S crowns, which had some, uh, I would say, they, they said it was radioactive material, something like the little dots on your watch dial that glow at night. And they made them remove that. And from Vita Deer S, which was like one of the best porcelains ever made, became Vita Deer N, which was a dog. It was awful because this uh, fluorescence causes the tooth to become alive. It's, it's, and if without it, it goes grayish. And so fluorescent is not just about uh, going to a nightclub and looking at blue teeth. That just doesn't work that way. So when you have materials that do and don't fluoresce, I have no idea who made this chart. Uh, somebody from South America sent it to me. And it's it's pretty accurate. And so if you look from starting from the left, you have Vita Suprinity, you have Emacs, you have Enamic, Mark II, YZ, uh, VM9, and VM13. And you can see uh, the first one is the material itself, whether it's a coping or an understructure. The second one is under uh, normal light. The third is under UV light. The fourth one is backlit. And so you can see, starting from the left, the Suprinity is very nice. The Vita Mark II block is almost a standard. That's also claimed by Vita to have to be the most uh, perfect material in reproducing tooth tissue. Uh, the Mark II block, Trilox, Forte, whatever you want to call them, it's all the same stuff. And uh, of course, the zirconia doesn't fluoresce at all. And one reason is that the firing temperature of zirconia to, to process it is so high that the um, elements that are put in there to fluoresce actually burn out at a, a fairly lower temperatures. So you have to depend on uh, some material to coat the zirconia in order to produce that fluorescence. Now, Noritake has a patent on fluorescing zirconia, but I've never seen it. I've measured uh, some of the uh, material. I just don't get the reaction with uh, 365 light. Maybe I'm wrong, but I do know that they patent one to detect fractures uh, in their pucks when they're like as a quality control, where they put this stuff on there, and then you can see where there may be a failure, so they don't sell it. They're a very good company. And so, uh, with that said your best chances of matching a natural tooth, especially single anterior crowns, is to do like a Mark II or a Trilux type of block layered with uh, Lumex if you want, or, or VM9, they're the same expansion. You can do a cutback and layer that, and I mean, it's hard to beat those crowns. Suprinity is fantastic, it just has a limited number of shades which I wish there were more, but I can't, uh, I have to wait for a patient to come in that happens to have 
the shades they make. And so I, I wish I could use it more because it's outstanding material as far as I'm concerned. And the Ambria also, which I'll cover in a second. So all of these materials are decent. Even uh, like the Emacs, I saw some Emacs. I think they changed and they added some fluorescence. This one doesn't show a lot, but I've seen Emacs. They may have used the glaze or something on it. I don't have a clear answer on that. And if anybody knows, let me know because I, I don't, I'm not 100% sure. And I just can't, uh, I can't commit to something if I'm not sure. And of course, all the way to the right, the problem with metal ceramics is the shadowing because the metal doesn't allow the light to pass through. Just like the early zirconias, they might as well be a metal coping. And so that's why they're so ugly compared to, uh, you know, the newer zirconias. So this is from the Ambria scientific documentation. Uh, has beautiful uh, little little picture and it shows all the materials and the fluorescent effect unglazed and then and then individualized and glazed with different uh, goodies like fluo glaze etc cetera, etc cetera. and um, it shows a really good explanation but they used a a what they call a black light a UV light high pressure from 340 nanometers to 380. So I bought a I bought a UV light. I talked to Jim about it, and I, I said I can't get any of these materials to react to anything. And then I saw that the visible, you know, the the, the light, the nanometer was 395. So visible light starts around there and at 400. And that light was to detect uh, freon leaks in a car. I came to find out later. <laughs> So I couldn't get any response whatsoever, but from uh, 340, 365, you'd get a tremendous reaction. And that's what they use in the club like that. With that said, um, it's not just about going into a club and your teeth looking blue, et cetera. What fluorescence really does, there's a material in the dentine and the cementum called fluorospore. And what they do is when the light hits it, they hold uh shorter wavelength and then they emit a longer wavelength and then those fluorospores are in the dentine and the cementum they're not in the enamel uh, and that is what allows a tooth to become beautiful and brilliant when you go outside in the sunlight and if your crowns don't have this fluorescence it goes gray and that's why you know i tell the doctor don't tell that person to go outside I mean, there's nothing you can do about it if you don't have a fluorescing material. And you do in the Lumex and in the VM9, you need to use the liners. And once you use the liners or the fluo, uh, fluo intense in the, in, the, uh, in the Lumex material, you fire that on top of a coping, whatever you're putting it on, even Emacs or whatever, uh, Ambria, you put a little bit on there and that, that really changes things. So you have to keep that in mind that you have to try to meet all the elements that the tooth enamel and the rest of the tooth does. And so the fluorescence increases the vitality of teeth in, in normal light. Crowns without fluorescence lower in value in daylight and ceramics with too much fluorescent will overpower anything else. Sometimes you don't have a lot of stuff going on in a tooth. Here's one we haven't cemented. That's been it's we tried it in. Doctor sent me this picture, how good it was, and I said, Yeah, the crown looks good, but your photos are terrible. And so you have a big white spot in the middle there, which really isn't good, but try to get that patient to come back in. In this particular uh uh patient, you see the prep. Uh, you've got room to do stuff in there where where, where otherwise uh, you couldn't put lobes or anything if the prep was left too long, okay? And and remember, most of the stuff, the character of a real tooth is from the incisal ledge up to about like two millimeters. And some teeth don't exhibit a lot of incisal effects and are, and are more difficult to match because they're pretty much the same color from top to bottom. So unless you have the value pegged perfectly, and the crumb up peg perfectly, 
it's hard to match that tooth. This one was pretty tough. I'm, I mean, I got lucky. And it could be better, but I, I, I mean, it's it's just one of these things that you could do 20 teeth and you don't know if it's gonna get that much better. And again, after you cement it and they put the try and cement or whatever, then then that uh, can pick up a little bit more more color density at the neck. And of course, thickness is everything. So you don't want too thick. You want about a millimeter, maybe a little more. You know, if you go too much, it's no good. It's just like with these veneers. The the lab saying, "I need more room. I need more room." And what what you're doing is you're wiping out a good deal of the enamel, which is what controls the, the beautiful light plate. And you're 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 asking a piece of porcelain a millimeter thick to do the same thing that the whole tooth does. Come on, just because you can't quote unquote hit the shade. If you leave the tooth alone and barely prep it for a veneer, the tooth does all the work. You could do a little tiny thin veneer of just about anything and it'll blend in because the tooth is doing all the work. Here's another good one. See, this is uh, an implant situation with a gold, I mean, a, what do they call it? An anodized um, titanium abutment. And that one came out really nice. It's just one of those things that I, you know, you take the shade and the, that patient's tooth happens to look like the shade. I put a little bit of blue in the corners and a little, little cream edge, just like the teeth. And that one came out nice. And that we had to use HT zirconia because the post was so, you know, the post, we had to block it out. And then I put the liner from uh, VM9 on this one and that increases the, the light scatter and it really makes it look look nice. So that's one of my favorite crowns I ever did. So when you look at this, in my earlier slide, the second or third one into the presentation, I described that the materials that are being made that resemble a tooth enamel structure. So if you look at this, this is a Vita Ambria. When you first press the Vita Ambria, you have a structure like you do on top. That says, uh, I can't read it. Let me put my glasses on. Yeah, the first one is Vita Ambria magnified 20,000 times. This is basically after pressing. You can see this genius structure. Then after it's taken through its uh, curing process that once you press it, finish it down, you put it in the furnace. That's where you form these crystals and look how they start to resemble a human tooth tissue. So whenever you have a material that start, starts to resemble the, these, the, these uh, hydroxyapatite crystals, uh, then you're getting, you're getting a lot closer to being able to match the tooth without a lot of effort, okay? So that's called nucleation and pre-crystallization. So basically you melt it, you have it in a mold, you press it, it comes down, then you run it through this little cycle and that causes more crystals to grow. And at the end, you have your final product and it's it resembles the light scatter quite a bit from a natural tooth. It's really amazing. So that's one of my favorite restorations to make. I just wish we could mill it but maybe one day. Right now, it's uh, that's a lithium uh, disilicate like uh, Emacs. It opal, it has an opal effect and fluorescence, so it's quite a quite a good material. When you talk about suprinity, you have lithium silicate, which is uh, a little bit shy of a lithium disilicate. And what happens is it basically has a much smaller grain structures and this is a millable material. And by doing this, uh, you have better marginal adaptation because if you have larger crystals close to the margin, when you're trying to mill, you can, uh, unless everything goes your way, you can increase chipping, et cetera just because of the nature of the material. Think about these things like a jigsaw puzzle 
I remember my mom and dad would buy these puzzles. I'd come home and the whole kitchen table was, oh my God, like 10,000 of them with flowers everywhere. They wanted me to help. <laughs> Woo, I could not, I, I don't have the patience. But anyway, uh, if you have a jigsaw puzzle that has a million pieces, if you chip one little piece off a margin, that's really not a big deal. Uh, and if you have a hundred piece or a thousand piece puzzle, you're going to take a bigger chunk. So you have to look at it in those terms that the finer the particles, uh, the easier it is to reproduce a margin without a lot of headaches. I remember when we first did the Instagram courses, we had a guy that came out to uh, California to Vita and he brought a microscope and everything else and to no avail. I mean, I was doing mine, I would dip it and then I would burnish the margin into the plaster dye, if you know what Inseram is. And uh, you cook it, the dye shrinks and it pops right on and it's the same. But this guy was working on it too much and he looked at mine, he goes, man, this thing, there's no opening anywhere. And I said, look, you have a 20, micro, 20 magnification scope. Your hands can't move like that. If you move one little bit, it looks like a mile. And if the particle size of Instagram was so tiny that it could capture in detail the, the marginal area of a die, much better than any microscope it show you. So, so it's all dependent on the particle size. So if you're trying to, you know, it's like when you do an impression, if you take this really like the, like Elite HD from Zermac, I mean, that stuff, it has a fairly low shore hardness, but it's so detailed that, and like hydrocolloid, if you do it right, I mean, what's better than hydrocolloid? It's because it's capturing every detail. If you use these heavy body impression materials and then you try to line it and push it, I get hardly any of those impressions that have just the light body around the preps. Everything has been squished out by the heavy body. It's ridiculous. So you need to use mono, one, one uh, material that's rather soft and that's it. And the same thing with these printed models, you're designing everything on the screen. And so you better make sure that machine is, like the electronics are way ahead of the milling. So you could have, do a capture and you have to work on the margins a little bit and the models of course they shrink and uh if you don't do the proper post processing it's it's really difficult so how do we copy sizal effects i think i showed part of this in my last slide or i i can't remember but this is how i do it some of these lectures overlap a little bit so i take a piece of of a leftover Vita block, steric block, and then I go up to the tooth and then I try to mimic what I see there. And I learned this from a body shop. If you have a car and, and you, somebody dents your door, you just want them to paint the door. You don't want them to take a run and paint from the front headlight all the way to the back to blend it. So I put that on there. I paint it just off to whatever I see in effect. And then I don't put it on top of the effect and then I kind of know what I have to use. And I make myself a little diagram of all the goodies that I'm gonna put on there. And I actually uh, draw that on my quite, uh, it's like a ceramic tile and it stays on there. That's where I put the powders, just like that. And that way I know, I don't do that for every case. Well, when it comes to a barn burner like this thing, I have to. So you see, I painted on the real tooth and you can see these little lobes. On the left, you see like a little bit too yellow. On the middle, you can't see it. On the right, it's a little white. So I basically mix it up. And then when I make the crown, I have to put in there, at least as close as possible. And of course, you can see on the natural tooth, the contrast between bluish and the creamy halo again. So mo you can't go wrong always putting like a little creamy halo on interiors and put a little super light bluish if you don't have a lot of wear on your teeth without seeing the patient. Very light. 
Don't do it on a bleach shade because those gals will get mad at you. They'll say, what's that little dark spot there? I said, well, I don't know, <laughs> but I'll take it out. And that's the problem. So you see, I paint that on that little piece there, and I can actually fire that, take that off and fire it and take it back to the lab and work on it. And so basically whatever's left after you mill a crown, just break it off and shape it like a central. And then turn it around, you have number eight and number nine or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. So the idea is to modify this little tab. We were gonna do a Vita block crown on her. And that way we have all the information that we need. And it's pretty thin, see? And see-through. So that you have to, at the 0.5 millimeters, it's, it's you, if you have good tooth color underneath, that's all you need. The thicker your porcelain is, the more you're asking it to do to modify the light exactly like the, the other natural tooth, and it's just, it's never gonna happen. And I put a, you see, you see how strong that looks. There you go. You can keep doing whatever it is you want. Paint it. Practice makes perfect. And then you can see how these crowns are matched up. See if is that Spanish on the bottom there? Good. Here's another case that we did. This is tough because you have half a tooth, a prep, and then a broken one. So one is a veneer. They're both, they're one's a crown, and another one is a veneer. And those can become really problematic because of the thicknesses. So we do, uh, Mill them out of the same Vita block. We we try them in for fit, and they're all super gingival. Uh, Dr. Blanco doesn't like to go underneath the tissue, and of course, if you have good tooth color, it's not a problem. But if it's if it's uh, how can I say it? If the color up there is not right, it's you you can see a ledge. So. These look pretty good, but we do a couple of try-ins, one for color, one for fit. And uh, they come out pretty nice. It's just, it takes a lot of time to do these. Now we don't make this anymore, but you can still get a stump shade out of flowable or whatever you use and make sure that it's similar to the prep. Biggest problem is we make all this beautiful stuff, but nobody wants to use it. And here you have from bleach shade to five and three. And so, you know, the best is to just use a flowable uh, that you can get in any shade and you can mix and match so that your prep color looks, looks more like your, um, your, your whatever the, the, the stuff. That way, when you try these crowns on, we used, uh, we used a, a a one and one and so that way you know you know exactly what you have and so it gives you a preview of what the the veneer might look like once it's in the mouth so if you have a an off color uh stump shade and you put your veneer on it, you can't really stain it or color it or put anything if you have to because you don't really know what it's going to look like so this way by matching the stump shade I think somebody was going to make even a refractory die with different shades on it up in Tennessee somewhere, but uh, I haven't heard of that anymore. And you see how it fluoresces. So the material and the, and the teeth fluoresce perfectly. And that's what they look like, see? So they, they match the patient's prep fairly close. So it's, it's, it's all this is is improving your predictability. There's nothing else. So first you have to know what color looks like. Giller calls it a sixth sense. So for instance, when you're working on some of these crowns or looking at a two shade, you say, you know what? I kind of think I know what that is. But unless you've had experience with a ceramic material for a while, not just, oh, I'm gonna, use this stuff and all of a sudden you're an expert, it doesn't work that way. So you have to see 
you have to see what all the modifiers look like, all the opal materials, everything. And then once you fire those things and get to learn them a little bit, when you see those in the mouth, you say, you know what that looks like on a one and one, but it's got this, let's just say the blue opal or blue sky or whatever they call it. And so you get a sixth sense for what it is that you're looking, what you need to use. And that's what Geller used to tell me all the time. You have to go by your sixth sense. I go, I only got five and they barely work. <laughs> but anyway, that's a, that's a, something you have to learn to improve your predictability. And the only way to do that is you have to know exactly what your colors are. You can't tell, you know, without using the material and firing tabs that you become an expert, it just doesn't happen. So here you see the first one tried in. And now we have to seat at the contacts because it's not dropping all the way. And, you know, these guys want these contacts left a little bit so that we can polish them in right there in the mouth to make sure we close all the gaps. We're getting closer and then we polish. See, everything's closed. And that is how you reproduce a lot of these incisal effects. You have to put the teeth end to end and take a picture like that before you start. And you can see the little whites, the little blues, the little blues, et cetera, et cetera. Again, this goes back. This goes back to 1974 again, which is amazing when you think about it. So McLean was trying to figure out how to tell the technicians to build the crowns up. And of course, at that time, when you use metal ceramic, you had some really, really bright opaques. So the typical metal ceramic smile would, would be an overfired porcelain with a very bright opaque. And then they you'd have to put a uh, low value stain like you see that violet stain on the on the middle of the tooth down that's to knock down these colors it was ridiculous and then vita and ceramco came up with paint opaques the ceramco ones handled a million times better than the vita ones and then they finally uh vita was able to make some really really nice opaque. and so with this set, you have to control the light reflection uh, of these things. If you use a metal, you know, incisal effects are, I don't care what it is, an incisal effect is an incisal effect, and you have metal ceramic, uh, Emacs, what, whatever, uh, Suprinity, you got so many different materials, but yet you have to match the same thing. So you have to have certain nuances of each one of these things. And in metal ceramic, it's just like a doctor that wants to wants to make the crown just a little bit better, okay? And it's so close, you can barely see the difference. And then they ask the lab, to, can you glaze it again? Can you add this? Can you add that? And by the time you bake it three more times, the crown is shot. It's shot because you're ruining the crystals, especially in the old metal ceramic. And you can see that in some of the lower fusing like lithium disilicate materials you have to be careful with the firing temperature and the number of bakes because the, re the crystallization is not the same and then you lose this beautiful scatter because they are quite nice looking materials so you have to have a plan on how you're going to build a crown you're going to layer it with all of these materials i mean one of my favorite things is to do is to have a beautiful zirconia like yz ST like uh, 3M2 or, or 2M whatever and we cut that back and the neck color and everything I barely reduce the zirconia on the neck part and I just do from the middle down and do beautiful enamel colors and that you can make a really nice crown and so it's almost a half of a layer and so when you use pre-shaded zirconia and they're really close to the final shade uh, then you just need to replace it with enamel. In my conversations with Yamamoto, he would layer uh, whitish enamel, really light, not a lot 
not a lot of white in it, but he mixed it like 5%, whatever. I mean, this guy can make 10 teeth and they all looked identical. I mean, I can't do two teeth identical. He's like a machine. And those teeth look so beautiful. And he goes, you have to use a, a, a whiter enamel on top of the dentine, ever so slightly whiter. And then you cover it with a, a clear, like an opal clear or a whatever. And what that does is it gives the tooth a brilliance of a natural enamel. If you just put the enamel all the way to the top, it's too white. If you don't cover with clear, you have, if you use too much clear, it's gray. So he, he has two layers, an enamel layer that's whitish, and then he would put like a clear opal layer on top. And that's those, his teeth were outstanding. So this is what happens. You have to learn when to stop firing. You destroy the grain boundary. So if you have a uh, an old like Ceramco uh, or VMK68, a VM13 does not do this. Uh, it's much more resistant to this. So what happens is you fire it too high, you melt everything. So you're turning another jigsaw puzzle from uh, a quite a large one nothing and so the light doesn't scatter so when the light enters human enamel it's bouncing off all those crystals everywhere if you over fire that you turn a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle into a hundred piece jigsaw puzzle and the light goes through too fast strikes the opaque layer and bounces at you so you have a low value glass covering a high value opaque and that's why they called it a everything, a headlight, a lemon drop, I don't know, wherever you go, every state had a different name for an ugly PFM crown. And uh, what's amazing is when Dicor came out and doctors started to prep for Dicor, they'd give you a beautiful shoulder prep. And you ask them to do that for porcelain fused to metal and it was like if you were an alien from, you know, from another planet. And it's like, well, how come you can't do a shoulder prep for this? I mean, it's unbelievable. So they, they would do these shoulder bevels, which is the worst thing ever. And of course, you have to keep cooking it. And you block the light to the root so the tissue goes gray. So there's a lot of problems with PFMs unless you do a shoulder prep and a butt margin and a beautiful fluorescing uh, butt margin if you want to if you want to really do a nice one. So the Lumex recommended temperatures only go to 760. And these guys, <clears throat> every furnace is different. So you need to make sure. This is called the thermodynamics. It's a study of heat, basically. So if you have a big full arch zirconia and you lay it down on a pad, on a fibrous pad, the, 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 it's terrible. You're going to overcook the top and undercook the bottom. You need to have it suspended or air flows around it. If you have a gigantic ponic next to an abutment, fill that abutment up with uh, putty, you know, whatever you want to call it, and put a pin in it. That way it, it slows down when it's cooling much slower because the ponic is going to take forever to cool. And then you have an abutment that's it's a prep, you've got a hole in it, and that'll cool really fast. So I always fill those up and really slow cool it to make sure. The advantage of Lumex is that you can fire these beautiful zirconia arches and you still can cook it at a lower temperature. You just have to preheat it a little bit longer because the material needs to be hot enough to accept the lower fusing porcelains. So you start to pre dry at 400. And if you don't leave it in there for a while, I like to leave mine sometimes eight, eight, ten minutes. And then that way, that framework is nice and hot. And when the lumex starts to fire, it adheres beautifully to the zirconia. If you go too fast up and then you have too fast of a rate, the lumex or any low fusing material will start to, to fire, melt basically, and it can actually pull off of the zirconia. Uh, and so I always slow that down. Now, since it's only going to like 760, 770, as long as you're getting a, a, a little sheen on your on your Lumex, that means you're good. And if you have 
if you have a big pontic and you fire it and your abutment comes out higher higher shine than the pontic that means you have to slow the rate down more so that that pontic can heat up and help cook the porcelain so there's a lot of little nuances you have to watch when you're putting porcelain on zirconia. Uh, and one of them is making sure the framework is hot enough to accept the Lumex material. And when you cool it down, cool it down to 500 Celsius. Don't bring it down um, you know, any higher than 500. So the glass transition temperature is 565. That means when it's melted, it'll start to turn to uh turn hard let's just say at 560 and so you need to go by that temperature nice and slow and then you'll be good but don't don't try to bring it straight out when you glaze it's the same thing how many of you have ever glazed a, a zirconia bridge you put glaze on it and the ponic is comes out undercooked and the rest of the crowns come out fine because there's air inside and out of a lot of the Crown, but when there's a big ponic, it takes forever for that to heat up. And so I always use uh, the LT glaze and I fire it on zirconia by itself. I go to like 800 and slow cook it. 750 is, uh, is great for everything else, like Lumex, Emax, everything else is fine. You may have to go 10 degrees, 5, 10 degrees up and down depending on your furnace and uh i i like visual calibration better i cook i take a crown i paint it with glaze run it up and if it's too low i raise it up if it's too high i bring it down and so once you do that a few times you sort of kind of get to learn what you're what you're supposed to do you know so uh Accidents will always continue to happen. <laughs> no matter no matter what happens, somebody's always going to crack a tooth somewhere. It's a very nice young lady that going to Brown University a few years ago, and she did a face plant on the sidewalk. And of course, how do you match this thing? These are really difficult. So immediately what we what we determined was that the dehydration is is the enemy and uh dr blanco did a suck down tray and we put glycerine and ringer solution and while we were prepping the teeth uh she would have to wear this so that they wouldn't dehydrate you can see how white they are starting to get already and it was really difficult to to work on her because I couldn't see anything so we Actually, that preparate, you see the provisional that she has, that used to match. And once her teeth dehydrated, I told George, I go, yeah, the teeth are drying out, they're turning white. So I can't take the shade now, but we ended up do, doing it. You can see uh, the preparate, the, the, how gray it looks. And it used to match. The teeth are dehydrated, and it takes a long time, 24 hours. That was also, that study was also done by Yamamoto, and he presented that at the first ceramic symposium in London in 80, 83 or 80, no, in 84, at the Barbican Center. And you see all that was due to dehydration. And he says it takes at least 24 hours to rehydrate the teeth, not, not just a couple hours. So Vita blocks have been around for what, 30 years? Look how thin the one on the left is. You can see on this stump uh, die that I did, you can just see the tooth, how clear it is right there on the incisal because her teeth were bucked. And George didn't take uh, enough off there, but that's fine. And so we ended up uh, doing this too. So this looks, from a social distance, it looks fine. From slightly closer, it looked a little grayish. And so we decided to do it over again because it's got to be, for this girl, had
sorry, everyone. From my end, I um, we've lost Felix's audio. So it looks like Felix is re. There you go. Are you there now, Felix? Can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. Great. You know what happened? I forgot to plug my computer in. <laughs> This is the this is the last slide. I timed it pretty close. Anyway, we started off with this and we ended up with this after we finished. So that was a that was a tough one. Anyway, thank you very much. And uh we'll field some questions. I hope you enjoyed it. All right, thank you, Felix. That was a great presentation. Let's uh, do a couple more housekeeping items and we'll get right to the questions. We have many questions, so let's, uh, let's get going on this. Everyone should be able to see my slides. So uh, those of you that are looking for CE credits, uh, make sure that uh, you check your uh, emails. Uh, we will send you some information with the registration information you, we have on file for you, from you uh, signing up for this webinar. The recording of today's webinar will be posted on our VITA Learning website, the VITA North America YouTube channel, with other uh, postings as well. So please join us. Felix has done several uh, webinars over the last uh, year or so. Please visit us. Uh, there's a lot of different material, a lot of different um, themes and uh, products and so forth. If you need to have uh, contact with your local Vita sales rep, here's some information for that. And then we have other opportunities, remote uh, webinars such as today's with Felix and others. Uh, so here's a list of the remaining uh, dates for this year. We've got quite a few scheduled and we will continue to bring to you uh, these remote webinars. Uh, they seem to be very convenient for everyone, even with, though that we're, we're past the COVID, or for the most part, uh, a lot of it. You can reach our help desk or support hotline anytime. Um, I really didn't never discuss this with you, uh, uh, Felix, but I assume it's good for us to give out your name and your email address in case someone has a follow-up sure. question. If not, I'll delete it real quick so no one sees yeah. it. What you, do and, have to, uh, what you do have to change is that it says here that I have a BS degree. So I don't know if that means right, well, bachelor's or something else, because I only have an AA. <laughs> all right, we'll, we'll, change, we'll change that. Um, <laughs> all right, so as far as questions, let's go uh, see what we have here. Uh, I know we have one from a group of people. They just want to say hi. Uh, really appreciate you uh, from Nick, uh, Azara, and then uh, Nasana, yes, and also Daryl. They want to say hi and appreciate everything you have. Uh, Thank you. Lars was mentioning about the uh, Emac Flow Glaze has uh, fluorescence, uh, like most, including the V glaze that it has yeah. some fluorescence to it as well I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the material itself if it fluoresces, yeah. and i'm not sure because i've and had some people we, that say yeah and some say no and then we have a question uh can you cut back a full zirconia crown and layer the incisal yes you have to the the one i mean we used to do that all the time with the original zirconia that was so opaque that we used to do copings. The, the difference is, is nobody was slow cooling it back then. And so there was some chipping. And if you do cases like carte blanche on any kind of occlusal situation, you increase the chances of fracture if you have a malocclusion or you don't protect uh, you know, your excursions and the incisal edges, your copings are too short. On all kinds of possibilities. I mean, I've seen copings where they just used to dip them, remember, like in ceram, and you had everything else. And the flexural strength of the porcelains back then was like 80 megapascals. 
that's it. At least today we're over a hundred, but still you need framework support. And that way you can, you can build up a, a zirconia crown on a coping, sure. All right, uh, for those of the, uh, that have uh, emailed a question about um, what is the difference, can you go over again the difference between uh, what you consider the lobes and the mammalons? Yes, the, the mammalons are on the outside of the incisal edge. If anybody was raised on a farm and they've seen a chicken trying to get out of an egg, a little baby chicken, they've got a little point on the beak which goes away later and that helps them break through the shell. That's pretty much what the mammalon does. They are the extension of the developmental lobes, but they're on the outside of the tooth. You can see three little bumps on the lower anterior of freshly erupted teeth. And as they wear away, those go away. But the lobes, uh, teeth develop, anterior teeth, developed from four lobes, three facial lobes and the cingulum, which is the fourth lobe. And you have two developmental grooves uh, in between the two facial lobes. And so those are lower in value. They have more uh, inner prismatic material. And so they're slightly a little lower value than the lobes themselves. And so sometimes when you layer, you can put in little tiny bits, depending on how much room you have. And like I said before, one of the most important things is developmental lobes are dent. They're not enamel. And so if you put too much fluorescing material on the tips of those lobes, they, they could jump out a little bit too much. But again, that depends on the tooth. You have some terrific contrast. Some of these teeth are beautiful where they have like blue and then you see like three fingers, like a crown almost, inside the tooth with lots of color. Uh -huh. And that's just a uh, contrast is really key to uh, figure out how much of a contrast there is between inside the tooth itself, from translucent effect to opaque effect. That's really important. All right. And then kind of a related uh, question. Um, when you create these uh, internally, do you, do you try to do it with the porcelain or do you do it with the with external stain colors or I try glass to stains? I try to do it, when I build it up, I try to do it with a porcelain. Like sometimes you could have a, like an A3 crown and you may use A1 just a little bit on the lobes, something like this, or you could use some, some other modifier, but it's always better to use something that you're very familiar with and know what the color is gonna be. And it's hard to take the shade of an internal lobe because it's being modified by the enamel. And so you, that's where that sixth sense come in. So what I've done uh, many times is I fire like a shell, like a veneer of enamel, okay? Then what I do is I paint the inside of the enamel. Like if I did a veneer on foil, peel the foil out, and then I start painting inside. And that way I kind of see what, the, what that color is going to look like coming through a skin of enamel. So I'm building it backwards. Like if I'd had the facial surface of the tooth first, <laughs> and then I put stuff behind it and I, oh, okay, here, that looks pretty good. That's why those little tabs from the Cerec machine work so well, because you could take those and put, put stuff behind it and hold it right up to the tooth. So All any right. point in the storm, as they say. Uh, here's another one kind of a, um, a specific, do you have a formula, idea, or a formula for severe tetracycline orange brown low value enamel? At what thickness? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's really it's a general difficult. question. Yeah. Here's 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 what I do. I go to the office, or the patient comes to the office. And then I have my stains mixed. I never double dip. So I have a brush that's nice and clean. And I tell them, I go, I have to touch your tooth. And then I put the brown and the oranges right on top of that. Whenever I can't see where I put it, that's the color I'm going to use. And then on some of those, the tetracycline teeth, I usually do what's called a set stain technique, 
where you paint it on there, lock it in, and then try it, and then cover. And that's how Adriansen, a, a uh, technician from the Netherlands, taught Dr. McLean how to characterize teeth because Adriansen used to make his own porcelain because they didn't have any effects back then. And he, he did a lot of his work using set stain uh, to get the color and then he would fuse it and then he would cover it. And that still works today. Like I said before, I don't know if there's trans if there's uh, fluorescing stains, but if you have a beautiful crown that fluoresces and then you put a stain on the outside that doesn't, you're going to see dark spots. So I'm going to be working on that the next, uh, I guess September, <laughs> and see if I can. Yeah, you have a lot to. Do. You have a lot to do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> you still have to write that book. Uh, not yet. That's hard. All right. So <laughs> after you layer your dent, then do you put the slight white enamel over that, and then e and use the enamel and translucence like opals? I do sometimes, especially if I have multiple units. But if I have single units, I have to really be careful and sometimes I'll fire a tab and see how close I get. At least I have that advantage that I can see the patient. But the bigger the case, the more you can play around with stuff. And usually, I mean, if you just take like a regular enamel and put like 5% white, nothing. I mean, nothing, just a little bit and build that up and then cover with your opal translucent material. That's what Yamamoto, I believe it's page 284, uh, that'll that'll say that. And that's how, hold on, I got the book right here. Let's see. Now, I don't have the page right away, but basically I remember that uh, clearly. Let's see. Yeah, five five percent white uh, modifier to your in incisal, and then you fire that, and then you cover with the opal. His teeth are beautiful, but remember, a lot of those are big cases, so he could make the teeth really. I mean, it's unbelievable. This guy, him and Katayoka yeah. were stable mates at Kyoto Dental Studio. I mean, Osaka Dental Studio, sorry. And then uh, uh, they worked together for like 20 years. And those guys are unbelievable. All right. Well, we got uh, a couple more. Um, yeah. When we want to make a natural enamel by layering porcelain on zirconia, uh, there is some rate of flaking or debonding porcelain from the zirconia. What is your recommendation other than uh, heat rate cooling uh, to strengthen the bond and, and avoid that? Well, if you're getting any debonding from uh, the zirconia itself, is because uh, the wash, quote unquote, the wash material that you're putting on is way too thin. And I mean, I've seen, I go to labs there and I watch them, I go, let me see how you put a wash on. And they literally take the brush and you can almost see through it. And so once it's fired, you see a, a little little shiny spot where the, the wash material, whatever they were using, uh, fired. And then a little flat spot where it didn't, there's, there wasn't enough material, it's too watery. So I always teach them to put a little bit heavier wash so it's nice and shiny when you fire it it should look glazed and that seals seals the the deal there and then you can just barely air braid it and a lot of times if you just are putting uh the enamel on top of the zirconia well, you still have to bond it no matter what but what happens is if your rate is too fast the enamel starts to cook and shrink and pull up because the zirconia is not hot enough 
to accept the material. You can see that clearly on a lot of zirconia restorations where they go, when they try to go all the way down to the margin and they leave the margin a little fat, when it fires, it pulls up away from the zirconia. So you have to make sure that that uh, area is covered well with a wash, nice and shiny, and don't overbuild in that neck area too much and slow it down. All right, thanks. Uh, what do you use to create your halo effects? The one on top of my head or the, uh, oh, on the teeth, it's I use the dentine. Let's say if I'm doing an A1, I build the crown up, I put the, like soft enamel or bluish, whatever you want. And then on the second bake, once I get the height that I want, I'll cut in with a little diamond and then I flow in uh, the same dentine that I use for the tooth. Because right. that, halo, that halo in nature is produced by the dentine at the cervical. That's light is exiting through the incised ledge. If you put your finger behind it, that halo goes away. So it's picking up the color of the dentine, the enamel is, and say, out you go. So you need to use the same uh, the same dentine that you're using. It's always going to be like a creamy white, like an A2 makes a nice halo. <laughs> Oh, uh, last one with uh, without a, a photograph. Is there a way that you have your dentist describe the bluish gray translucency of an enamel uh, so that you can have some guide? The best thing to do is if you're in a long term relationship with this dentist or want to be, is to provide him with uh, shade tabs that you cook and send it to him. I fire tabs all the time and say, here, hold this up and see how close it is and tell me what the number is. That's the only way to do it. You can't uh, really describe that. And even the photographs aren't that perfect. For instance, right. you can read five books on dental photography and they're all going to say something different. And I know that if you're trying to send stuff over the internet, you have web safe colors, you have a limited color space. Um, and I don't know the monitor if it can reproduce uh, all the colors. You have to have a pretty decent ones. They're much better now than they were years ago. Oh my God. And so uh, you can take a picture with the shade guide in place. If the doctor and the assistant or whoever it is can visually say hey you know what it's a 1m1 or a 2m1 whatever the heck it is and i held this tab up and it's this blue or it's this orange whatever it might be and you get a visual and then you photograph that then you're pretty sure you can get really really close you really can we have a doctor in naples that he's been working uh with photographs with a guy up in virginia somewhere who's really good this guy and I saw a couple of crowns that he made with photos. It was amazing. But it doesn't right. happen all the time. You've got to have visuals of what is it that you're using. So that the, the I think it's the lab's responsibility to go to the doctor and say, this is the stuff I'm using. These are the colors that I have available. And I'll make you some tabs. Bill him for it, you know? And say, okay, oh, because Vita doesn't make the tabs anymore. Somebody's got to make them. And you know how I make them. I take, uh, mix the powder up. I take a, a real smooth napkin and then I pick it up and I just rub it on the napkin, flatten it out, peel it off, put it on a firing tray. I don't go with all these little machines to make tabs. That's ridiculous. They all break when you're trying to take them out anyway. So I just uh, cut them, grind them down a little bit and send them little chips, put them on a, little plastic stick, you know, like we used to do the composites, those clear sticks with the retention. I cut a slot in it and put the tab there and they can, they can spray it with uh, whatever they want mm. at the office. Crown Royal. All right. 
Yeah, it's a, that's a good sound way to do that. It, it, you, you know, you got to do what you got to do to to get the right information uh, if, if you don't want to redo cases. So that's like I say, uh, the, so, big, the bigger the case, the easier the color. Yeah. So Felix, uh, this wraps up today's uh, webinar. So I want to thank you very much for joining thanks. us and providing excellent information. Any last minute thoughts or comments you want to make to the uh, group? Well, I can tell you that obviously practice makes perfect, but <laughs> you have to get a really good sense of what the teeth look like. And if you if you have a chance to go to a dental office and actually look at your work, you say to yourself, oh, wow, because it's a lot different looking at a model. And then looking at a patient, you say, oh, I could have done this or I could have done that. And it doesn't mean it's bad. You may have nailed it. You never know, but it's always better to see how your work is looking in an office. I'll give you a, for instance, if you take a crown and build it with the original zirconia, uh, and then you build it with a translucent zirconia, you're basically building up the same thing, but they're going to look totally different. And so you say to yourself, wow, how could I have done this? Now, if you, if you saw your work with the opaque zirconia, you say, how can I improve this? How can I make this? And if you use a real translucent zirconia, they could come out too gray looking. So you have to kind of catch yourself in between. And the best way to do it is to go see a, a patient and uh, see, you know, ask the doctor, I, I would love to see, you know, how this looks in the mouth if you, if you let me. Please, doctor. <laughs> Well, uh, very sound, sound advice. So, so again, Felix, I want to thank you for joining us and providing excellent uh, education. Uh, for those of you that have uh, joined us, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll hope to see you again on another future uh, Vita Learning Remote Webinar. And so this will conclude today's webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Jim.